philosophers that we're especially looking at today, because I had the free choice to pick them. One is Sartre, Jean Paul Sartre, which, is that easy to say, Sartre? How do you say Sartre? S-A-T-R-E, and it's French. And then the other is Daniel Dennett. So Sartre and Daniel Dennett. Hypothesizes that uh, you know, while the, the one crow is giving the mouse the magic feather and the mouse presents it to Dumbo and Dumbo realizes, oh, I could fly because I have this magic feather. Of course, remember, the magic feather is just fake. So then it hypothesizes, what if I were the crow that came up and said, hey, Dumbo, that's not really a magic feather. It really won't help you fly. Everybody in the audience would say, stop that crow. So he's the crow. He's the one that's talking about uh, um, you know, criticizing uh, our culture's way of thinking about our freedom uh, um, by applying science to it. Um, and so everybody would be trying to stop that crow. In fact, there, there are articles written. Uh, he's referring in this uh, to a book that he wrote back in 2003 titled Freedom Evolves. So, so I'm going to contrast his point of view with regard to freedom versus Sartre, whose freedom is uh, merely, I think, a cons they're both conceptual. They're both, they're both ways of thinking about our freedom. Right. How many folks feel like they're free agents? It's mandatory, right? You all have to feel that way because we're Americans. We've already talked about that. Right? Being Americans, you're the ubermensch. You have to choose for yourself. Even if you choose not to choose, says Sartre, you have to, you're still choosing. Uh, so remember the heretical imperative, Peter Berger, you know, that as Americans, you're condemned to be a heretic. As, as Sartre would say, you're condemned to be free, right? You have to write on the thing what your religious preference is. It's not like you can just say, hey, you know, what do you mean my religious preference? Of course, I believe, well, there is no of course, right, in, in the United States. Um, so you're condemned to be free to choose for yourself as an American. So we're, we're, we grew up with that kind of foisted on us, I suppose. Um, but I'm wondering, can we find an example of, say, um, what, what would you call it?
That's not what I want. Do you guys know what I mean? The people that walk. I, can you do it? It's kind of like, it, it helps if you have your pants hanging down on your ass. You know what I mean? <coughs> no, I have no idea. Sorry. You have no idea. Um, hmm. Maybe there's examples. Maybe it's not jive. What would you call it? Is it like a strut walk? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, Sorry, like, not gonna give like when you're walking with swaggers? Yeah, like when you drag your, okay. left, your back foot all the way forward or whatever. And that goes, Maybe, does George Jefferson do it in the, in the team? Okay, that's that's not what I want either. Maybe jive is not the right word. Maybe I should delete jive. But I can I can add um, with saggy pants. That should do it, right? Maybe not. I think the pants threw it off. The pants threw it off. I think it, yeah, I think it threw it off. Really narrow category of results. Funny shit, cool stuff. Gotta be funny. Saying, oh, my bad. I read the description. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I read the title first. Never mind. <laughs> What's funny shit, cool stuff? Well, then I read should I, play, should I no, click it? We're good. <laughs> Um, I know precisely what I'm thinking of. I don't know what I would call it, but um, is, is there a natural human walk? Um, I would say probably, yeah. I mean, I would say what there's be, to be considered a natural walk, like just regular, normal, or like mid speed swinging your arms. Uh -huh. Well, I know the army like the changed me because <laughs> I had to learn how to march. Yeah, I think it's the concept is, is universal, but there's people I can tell who they are by the way they walk, depending on where they're at. Yeah, yeah, and, and I would think an awful lot has to depend on your physique. The way you walk is is basically the way your muscles have have yeah. to work in order to move you, um, but. Oh, when I was in the army, yeah, for sure, I had to learn how to march. Right, and actually, I had already been sort of prepped for that because I was in the marching band both at high school and college. So <coughs> we had to march. Uh, but but even when you're in the military and you're walking, you have to walk almost as if you're marching, even though it's by yourself. Right, and. That sticks with you, I'm sure, that people see me walking and they probably identify that's that's more of a military walk than, than a casual stroll. Does that make sense? Yeah. So your, your walk can be modified by culture. But I would at the same time think that in general that people would naturally walk a way that their body would was watching, just coming in, thinking about this, I watched one young lady, student here, walking in, and she's so skinny that I think if you look at her from different sides, you might not see her. You know, the, that kind of, you know, like, there's there's a, a cartoon character um, in The Incredibles, I think, or The Invincibles, or whatever the cartoon was, where if you looked at, you know, if she wanted to, she became invisible. She just kind of stood, stood to the side and you couldn't see her there, right? So I'm joking about that. But she's that skinny that just the way she moved it struck me as being like, okay, so there's an example of a person that's not been in the military, way too young, yet um, walking the way her body sort of dictates to her. 
But I think culture can certainly change that. And so there's, there's I think, kind of, I, I would have called it a jive walk, but I don't know what it's actually called. But I think it's a deliberate walk that indicates revolution against the status quo. I think I know an example. There's a song um, by Robin Schultz, I think is how you say it, and it's called uh, Sugar, and in the end, the uh, the guy kind of like, kind of. the main character of the song video I don't, I don't know how to does do a it. swagger walk. Kind a of swagger thing. walk? So, so, so Robin Schultz? Robert Schultz. Sugar. Robert? No, uh, Robin. Yeah, oh. Schultz. Uh, sugar. 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 It, it should. I'll just go sugar, right? Yeah, I think it's just sugar. And I want. Okay, so that top one, yeah. So you're gonna go to the end of the video. So a little bit before, a little bit before. There you right, go, right here. So this part. Just that little bit there. Was that a good example, or were you well, thinking of something different? I was a swagger. I was more of a swagger. Yeah, I. I, I he was like deliberately like picking up his foot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, well, like. So, remember, my one son has fetal alcohol, and so I learned that I could, I could see him walking in a way where he's moving, but he's clearly not going someplace intentional, right? You know, when you see somebody walking and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm going into the office, you know, or I'm, I'm, park, I'm going to my car, you know, or whatever, right? You know, people walk in a way that you know that they're busy, they're, they're heading towards something that they want to get to, not in a hurry, maybe, right? But nonetheless, they're, they're directed walking. But there are others that will um, walk along, like you could see them like driving down uh, Bregal or, uh, you know, what, uh, you know I, I could see folks walking along, and they're walking in such a way that I know they're moving, not in a hurry, but it also doesn't look like they're walking someplace. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it's like they could change their mind at a, any moment and go in, in a different direction because they're not actually like trying to get someplace. They're just kind of moving. Uh, and, and to top that off, you know, when you add uh, that they dress themselves, right? Uh, I, I know I'm not dressed in any. I mean, it is a philosophy shirt, and it's got all sorts of phrases on the back and so on. I had the free choice. I mean, I, I have too much stupid clothing. And, you know, I'm looking at all the clothes, and I'm thinking, oh, I could wear a tuxedo. That would be dumb. You know, why would you wear a tuxedo to class? You know, that's just so, you know, you know, uh, you know or you know, could come in in the nude, too, you know, but that probably wouldn't, no. So I'm thinking of that the maximum minimum, you know, <laughs> right? So I'm, you know, casual. Notice I do not want my pants to fall down, so I have suspenders. There are people I do not know how the pants stay up because they're so far down, and there's apparently nothing holding them. I think what they do is they put a belt through just the front loop of the pants so that they can tighten it and keep it there, but then the back end isn't, so it can sag down. I think that's how it works. Am I wrong? Never tried. I'm talking to the wrong person, man. Any of you yeah. gangsters yeah. here? It's not a bad idea. I know. It seems like too much effort. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you're gonna go for an image. <laughs> that's the only way I can think of it being like physically possible. Otherwise, you know. But so, so if I see somebody walking along the street and they're walking in a way that doesn't seem indicative of intention, just kind of there, moving, um, and they even dress in a way 
that indicates that they're not aware that, you know, they like the shoes, they like the pants, they like the shirt, the jacket, the hat, but they're not aware that they don't go together at all. Right? You know, the, like everything clashes. They, you know, they like each, each piece, but it doesn't occur to them that there ought to be kind of a rational pattern to indicate, because they are indicating status as they're going, right? I mean, you, you look at a person and we do evaluate them based on what they look like, right? Um, and then you add to that the way they walk. Uh, so I, I think what happens is that there, there is a cultural walk that's a trained walk that says, I'm rebelling against the status quo, and I'm not going to walk <coughs> the way humans are supposed to walk. Does that make sense? So in a sense, they've evolved the freedom to dress a certain way or to walk a certain way. So are they doing it on their own? So Sartre feels like every decision we make is totally up to us. That there's no God is telling us this is the high value and everything follows from that so well, that I walk a certain way. I mean, that I realize well, that's even a reach. But. I think that's kind of abstract because whether or not there is the God with the higher moral values telling you what you should do, you still make the decision whether or not to do it, right? So you're still making the decision fully by yourself even if somebody tells right. you this is what you should should right. not do. Right. Well, in a, in a sense, uh, Sartre's critique of, he, he, well, he, he does claim to be an atheist. So just like um, uh, Nietzsche, for example, uh, you know, it's, you know, God is dead. You know, so, you know, there's no structure to morality. Instead, you, your, your own self, have to choose for yourself your, your own essence, so to speak, right? Because you know, um, while, uh, you know, if, if we think that everything has its own category, its own type of creature, uh, so that's kind of Aristotle, that's, you know, how we, we identify ducks. You know, like yesterday, uh, Donna and I were driving. We went down, we spent Tuesday night at the Alieska Hotel because we're, we're celebrating our, our 45th wedding anniversary, oh, nice job, right? which is Saturday. But Donna arranged for us. She figured, oh, you can go Tuesday night, right? So Tuesday night, we're, we went to the, the hotel took the tram up, you know. Um, I had a Ru Reuben sandwich at the deli there. Have you ever been up there? Yeah. Yeah, so nice. at the at the Boer Tide Deli or whatever, right? So I had a Reuben sandwich and we shared some fries, very romantic. She had a turkey, turkey, you know, sandwich. So, so you know, at, oh, it was too much. So we ended up bringing the sandwich, half of the sandwich back to our room and put it in our fri little fridge. Um, in the fridge? No. no. It just feels yeah, the, the <laughs> microwave. Every time you open the door. The microwave <laughs> turned out to not be a microwave. It turned out to be a safe that you had to use your credit card in order to use. <laughs> so, I've never owned anything that needs to be in a safe, actually. However, no, my deed. I have some paperwork in a, in a safe that I suppose to keep it from. But, so, so we put our sandwiches there, and we figured, ah, oh, that'll be breakfast. So in the morning, we took them out, and they were frozen. So I had half a frozen Reuben sandwich for breakfast while watching interviews of people that, that escaped with their lives from the Stephen Paddock uh, shooting over 500 people and killing 59. That was our morning in the hotel before we left. But on the way home, we're driving by 
and seeing the swans. So, so this is when all the swans are gathering and all the different little, uh, curious why they're all at one. And then we pass five or six other ones that look exactly like no swans. So why are they all there? Plus we get to Potter Marsh and we, we went out to like, take pictures and stuff. And there were two swans or four swans and a whole bunch of little black but it was hard to tell what they were. And Dada thought, oh, those are the babies. Uh, no, there's no way, because they, they have to leave now, and if they're that small, and they're supposed to be that big, there's no way they're going to be able to, to migrate at that size. There's got to be ducks, right? So we're arguing over whether they were ducks or, or cygnets, right? You know. um, where was I going with that? Migration. So, so animals um, have a type, right? So, I mean, we have stories that play with that, like the ugly duckling. Duckling. The ugly duckling, of course, turns out to be a, a signet that gets kind of separated from its family for some reason, and as it's being raised by a family of ducks wonders why the heck it's so stinking ugly compared to all the other ones. Very uh, elitist story, by the way, because of course once the, the baby swan joint rejoins its family, it realizes that it's, it thought it was an ugly duckling, but it turned out to be an absolutely gorgeous swan instead of an ugly duck, right? <laughs> right, you see the elitism there, right? Beautiful swans, you know, so ugly, Ugly duckling, uh, but it's actually Harry Potter. You know, once he's developed his magic, he's going to be a. I, I'm sorry, is that a, is that a switch there? It's a very elitist kind of story. You know, but lots of those. In our, you know, everybody grows up wishing that we weren't really a member of the crappy family we're in, but instead we were nobility that somehow got adopted by this family and. One of these days we'll discover we actually belong in Westminster or something. No, you never had that. No, okay. you didn't read the same stories when I was a kid, I guess. You know, the Prince and the Pauper, right? You never read, read that, Prince and the Pauper? No, hmm, shame, oh well, that was a great story. I think I read versions of it, like Prince and the Pauper. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, but the swan thing. So, so there are characteristics of animals that are there theoretically because God created them that way. That was the thought, right? And so everything behaves the way it ought to because it's of that type, right? And God created man in a way that she wanted us to be, right? And so we all ended up being the way we are, and, and in fact, for Aristotle, it's just like an eye. You know, if, if the eye is defective, we don't think of it as a good eye, but if it works beautifully, then it's a good eye. Same thing with a person. If you do what a person's supposed to do, you're a good person. If you, if you don't, you're a bad person. Defective person, right? Um, well, for Sartre, Human beings don't have that kind of character. We're totally free to create for ourselves. So there's no God-oriented structure that's supposed to organize a human life. And that's how a good person ought to be, right? Instead, you're totally free. In fact, you're condemned to, free, to be free, which is kind of interesting. I, uh, I remember, the time I read Sartre in school, I was depressed because I had been reading the development of, of philosophy up to that point. And basically the conclusion that everything was given me was that you know we're completely determined by science, you know, science can figure out, you know, you've got, you know, a specific set of genes, you've got I don't remember if genes were something we talked much about when I was in college, but I mean, basically, you, you're kind of predetermined. You're going to grow up to have a certain kind of nose and 
your eyes, whether they need glasses or not, is kind of already fixed. You know, it's not, not something that uh, um, you can change your mind. Right? I'm going to see fine without my glasses. You can't see anything. Right? It's not really up to you. Um, same thing with your physique, right? You know, how you're going to play sports and stuff. You know, if you decide, okay, I'm going to be a tackle. Not. Right? There's no stinking way I'm going to be a tackle, right? You've got to be six foot six, built like a tank. You know, that's how you have, right? Tackles. Tackles are like, oof. Right? You know, in order to, you know, you could be running for five minutes trying to get around the guy and you're still only, you know, halfway. What was the, the picture? The picture of the you know the football player who's you know really short you know and but nonetheless he scored a touchdown you know for his team right and they had a picture of him standing next to a tackle and the tackle is six foot six he's kind of like resting his arm down around his hip on his shoulders you know, <laughs> you know hilarious picture right you know so. Your physique kind of predetermines your possibilities. So that's all pretty pretty standard. I don't think there's a problem with that. Um, but for Sartre, no, you're actually totally free to decide for yourself how you're going to make the world. It's the same kind of thing that Nietzsche wants to suggest. Remember, you're the ubermensch. You're the one that determines moral values. Sartre's saying really the same thing. He's, respond, he's responding to exactly that same kind of dilemma. God is dead, there are no values, but we humans have to create our own values. Um, but in school, I was discovering that you know, actually everything that I did, everything that I thought, was all predetermined by my place in society, my biological condition, you know, my my family, my peers, so the, the very language I spoke would have been incredibly weird for me to grow up in a family in Philadelphia where we talk like this, you know, and everybody understood one another, you know, and then, and then all of a sudden I decide, okay, well, I, you know what, I'm going to speak Swedish. No, that just doesn't happen, right? You're not free in any of that, that case. Well, I, you know, in that sense, in college, became very depressed because I thought, you know, like I had free agency, I could do what I wanted. What kind of career would you like? You know, all, you know, it's totally up to you. You know, who, who would you marry, or would you become a monk? Would you ever consider becoming a monk? A nun? You could become a nun. Why can't you become a monk if you want? Because the church is sexist. Unfair. I think some of you should go to the church and complain that you want to be a monk. Well, I think you're upset that they won't let you because you're female. I think it depends on which sect of monk you're speaking of. If you're like a, a Shaolin monk, I think you could be female still. But if you're like a monk, as in like the Catholic sense, I think you can still only be male. So it depends on which kind of culture area you're going for. Although I think you still have to be bald for either one, so. Well, they, they can fix that for you. There's devices. You can choose to be bald. Unless, of course, you really are bald, in which case it's foisted upon you. I suppose. <laughs> However, I, I will, I, I, I had the, the family has the receding thing, mostly from my mother. My mother was the one that but all the sons, you know, we're, our hairline is going this way. It's thin, wispy, kind of mom-like hair. But, so where am I going with this? You know, um, Descartes comes along when I was a, you know, in college, and he points out that the reason you're free is because you have that subjective side, which for him was the en soi, right, the in itself, which is the translation we usually have for it, right, in English. And then there's the pour soi, the 
for itself, right? So the for itself is how I conceive of myself. So when I think about me being short, ugly, married 45 years, you know, all retired army, retired, what else am I retired from? Oh, so Social Security, that's a retirement, right? You know, all the, so I'm way retired, not just simply retired, I'm way retired, right? That's all the poor swa. In fact, there's nothing I can say about the en swa except that this is the subject that's having the experience. And that's hypothetical, right? Because I can't actually see me, right? Uh, um, I was thinking at the hotel, I'll take a picture of me, you know, I'll call it a selfie, right? You know, people do that, right? You know, actually, every picture I took of myself with the one camera was a selfie, right? Because thanks for that clip, by the way. Um, I'm still interested to see what you're thinking of when you're talking. Yeah, I'm wondering how would I find that. Um, so Facebook. So I want this. Where's all my pictures? Oh, I can go. I can go like this. None of those are it. What happened to all the pictures I posted yesterday? Maybe they were rejected. Ah, okay, so here's one. Sorry, it's fuzzy. So that's a, a self selfie, right? Except, well, what happened? It's loading. It's still loading. Yeah, because the other side is much clearer. The cam Remember, I dropped the camera, and so it doesn't work very well. It's still loading. Amazing. Why? That's very weird. But so this is... Somewhere along the way. So every time I take a picture with that camera, it ends up being a selfie, whether I wanted it to be or not. And I have really huge hands. <coughs> um, but when I'm looking in the mirror, that's not the en soi. That's still part of the poor soi for me. It's that's what my subjective side is experiencing, right? Well, so what's the difference between these two? I mean, Hegel will accept both of these, but then point out that our actual self is really the combination of both of them. So it's kind of a dialectical process. That, you know, you know, I'm, I'm constantly going back and forth between what I think of as myself and what my subject is actually, you know, at the moment, right? So I might decide, okay, I'm going to join the army, right? Uh, right. So so you have this plan. I'll, I'll go into the recruiters. I'll sign up, etc. Right. Um, well, of course, you're not that yet. You're signing up, right? But you go in and you actually talk to the recruiter. He sets you up to take the tests. You pass the tests. Sign the paperwork. Okay, so you, you have to show up at, you know, the you know, induction center at 7 a.m. on whatever date, right? October something, whatever it was. Right? So up until that moment, you actually could still not show up, right? But then you show up, and they, you know, put you through the, the process, and now, okay, now you're on the train with the ticket, and you're heading to Fort... Uh, 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 lost in the woods, in misery, the state of misery. Right. <laughs> Leonard Wood, Fort Leonard Wood. Of course, you could jokingly refer to it as lost in the woods and the state of Missouri, which can easily be misconstrued as misery, right? 
So off you go. So now you're actually in the army. And of course, they put you through all the stages and so on. So, so you're becoming what you decided, right? But at each step of the way, there's a gap. So that Sartre says, I am what I am not. So in my mind, when I'm thinking, this is me, this conceptual schema that I have that's me, that's what I am. So I am this. But actually, that's not what the onslaught is. So I am what I am not. And I am not what I am. <laughs> right. So what I think, so, so, so there's this gap between the two things, right? You know, you're constantly projecting yourself a certain way and trying to be it, I'm, you know, actively trying to be that. That's what I would like to be, right? But at the same time, you're not it. So there's always this gap. And for Sartre, that's where freedom enters into this deterministic scientific view of things, right? That everything is predetermined by the previous state. So whatever happens, as, as uh, Dennett says, you could imagine de uh, Laplace's demon that in some sense knows the entire future. You know? so, so he just has to have like a snapshot of what's going on and plugs it into the algorithm of knowing what's going to happen. You know exactly what's going to happen at the, you know, the next moment, right? Um, science, in a sense, science has to do that. Actually, uh, if if you're following a good scientific theory of some sort, you have to believe that all things are predetermined by uh, what's the, pre the previous situation. There can be no magical interaction, everything has to be explained by what is there before, right? Uh, so, so literally in the scientific language, you can't say, oh, a, ma a miracle occurred, right? <laughs> you know, this was happening, this was happening, this was happening, and then a miracle occurred, and then this happened, right? No, that's not part of any scientific theory, right? Because uh, uh, scientists want uh, to be able to explain everything. And so they already adopt the thesis that everything that happens results from the causes that led to it, right? And free agency or miracles, poof, you know, all of a sudden a miracle arrived. An angel said to me, think this way. Even that sounds like a cause, right? You know, you know, and all of a sudden I decided, oh, no, I quit. No, I'm not going to do it. I mean, you know, so for example, this guy, Stephen Paddock, everyone's trying to figure out what made him do it, right? You know, interview his girlfriend or you know, whatever, and you know, she said, oh, I have no clue. There was no sign of violence. Well, if you think about it, how do you get that many guns in your hotel room? You obviously, he's setting it up in order for him to do this on what, the last song of the, of the last night of this series of concerts, right? The room was clearly you know, determined by its ability to aim into the crowd, right? I mean, you're, you're all following how all this stuff is coming out, right? Um, you know, he had the tray with, I, I'm puzzled, why did the explosives he had in his car, why did they not go off? No one's talked about any of that. But, I mean, if he had explosives all set up, wouldn't he have planned on having all those blow up to add to the carnage at the time that all this happens? That seems interesting to me, because it, it sounds like he planned all this stuff in advance. And everybody's wondering, well, why did he do it? Psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, someone ought to be able to tell us, okay, so, what, what's your hypothesis? Anybody? You have a hypothesis? Why did he do it? 
No, but I was going to see if he had bombs in the car. That could have been his backup plan to escape if someone got to him ahead of time before he got to kill himself so he could try and make it to his car and blow himself up and everyone around him. That's going to be my guess for the car bomb. Unless it just didn't go off when it was supposed to, too. But why do you think he's decided to do this months ago? He probably, it's probably like a personal problem, and then it just came into a bigger problem that he couldn't stop or no one else noticed, so he kept it a secret, and then that's what he wanted to do, was well, aim at the concert. Well, have you ever had personal problems? No, that's just, just my No? Guess. Wow. Well, I think... Not <coughs> that, not kind of, not, not that, that, like, not <laughs> that kind of a <laughs> personal <laughs> problem I want to have a massacre, <laughs> but... But yeah. I don't know, just people get trapped and you know, and then there's like some illnesses that you don't get till you're an adult or just, I don't know, there's like kind of little stuff like that. It could have been also, I mean, I, I don't her know, theory is pretty guessing. accurate, but it could have also just maybe he wanted the attention. Maybe he wanted his yeah. name to be like spread about. Maybe he wanted people to know his name. He was competing with his dad. I have no idea, but you know, maybe <laughs> okay. he just felt like society ignored him or something, so he wanted to make a name and then go out with a bang. I think he was just influenced by like evil. And like that could be part of You mean like a magical thing? Evil just came into the room? Not, not a magical thing, just like, like influenced by just like, I feel like evil and wickedness say it's like not just stuff we do, but it's like something that can like go around and infect people who are like susceptible to that. Was in like demonic possession? I mean, no, not necessarily, because like we're humans, you know, like we have free choice. And maybe like uh, him wanting his name out was a big, like, like a, uh, you know, like not a genie, and they're like, oh, I'll let you fly, or I'll let you, and they make you into a bird or something like that. And it's like, oh, I'll make you famous, you know, I'll make you famous, just do this, and then influenced by evil. And then that's just how I kind of see it. And yeah, it could be like any of the other reasons too, but I think that's like wickedness. What was the What was the name of that movie where uh, um, the boy was, I think in his house, or maybe he wasn't in his house, but in any case, a jet engine dropped out of the sky. Oh, lit. Um, Darnie, Donnie Darko. Donnie, Donnie Darko. Darko, yeah. Are you familiar? Donnie Darko? It's a good movie. Donnie Darko. Yeah. Um, it is. It is very creepy. So he's, he's like sleepwalking. He sleepwalks at night. And one night he sleepwalks. And that same night uh, a jet engine lands in where his room was. It would have killed him. It didn't. And then he starts getting these like... Here's, here's the trailer. Yeah. It's a long trailer. Two twenty. Now he's And the music's weird too.
So, something like that, maybe. Would yeah, that be something like that. An intrusion of evil, in a way, into his life. That, that movie strikes me as exactly the opposite of uh, um, It's a Wonderful Life. Have you ever seen that one? Yeah. With Jimmy That's the Stewart. Christmas classic, right? Right, right. It's a Wonderful Life. And It's a Wonderful Life uh, uh, um, is just a small time credit union uh, uh, you know, banker. Uh, and uh, end up having trouble. The town is in economic trouble and you know, he feels like his, his whole life has just been ruined. Um, and so he gets drunk and he's about to jump off of a, and he does actually jump off the bridge, but his guarding angel pulls him out. Right, and says, "What are you, what are you doing?" You know, he says, "I, you know, my life is total, you know, totally ruined." And, and, everything. and the angel convinces him, "Well, do you want to see what your life would have been like, or what your community would have been like without you?" Right, and so they go back into um, his past, and now they're looking at the village, and and you know the the his credit union wasn't there, and, or the savings and loan. What he calls it, right? You know, so the savings and loan wasn't there, so all these people didn't get house loans and stuff, and so the, the town is horrible. You know, it's kind of like Las Vegas in a way, you know, instead of a nice town, right? Um, and his loving wife and all of his kids never happened. You know, she's instead a spinster working at the library and no kids, right? So all these wonderful kids, you know, that he he loves, but you know, they're also annoying. You know how kids are, right? Uh, so, so he comes to realize that, wow, his life has been a wonderful life, and he wants to go back. And so, of course, the angel puts him back, and he's in the car. Instead of jumping in the river, he's got a, a bumped head, and he's, like, all thrilled because, hey, I'm alive. <laughs> he's got a bumped head. And so he comes back, and he's hugging his wife, and, and then, of course, everything all works out wonderfully. So if you think about, you know, your life is really valuable. You might not realize it, but if you compared what the hole you would have left and what ha would have happened, it would have been absolutely horrible for everyone else. You clearly have been a good, a source of good for all the people that you've interacted with, right? Well, Donnie Darko, right? You know, he's, he was meant to die when that engine fell on the house, right? But because he didn't, because he just happened to be out of, you know, that he ends up somehow in a kind of parallel universe, and because he's constantly interacting with this kind of being on the other side of the portal that he describes as this bunny rabbit, which you saw in a couple of the scenes in the trailer. Terrifying, right? rather, right? Terrifying yeah, and he ends up causing hellacious damage to the community, right? Friends die, you know, all sorts of horrible things die, and he comes to realize that the reason all these things are happening is because he didn't die when he was supposed to. And so, I don't, well, I'll ruin it for you, and it's in the, you know, so he finally decides to somehow go back into time and die. And then, of course, the end of the movie, everybody say, oh, it's such a shame that he died. But his friends are back. And in other words, all the hellacious damage that he did after he ac accidentally ended up living, right, you know, is, has all been healed because he's dead. So with, if you compare the two movies, you know, it's a wonderful life. Your life is a positive thing for everyone. And Donnie Darko, his life is a negative thing for everyone. It's better off for the world that he's not alive. Does that make sense? The, the two movies are like direct opposites. And of course, It's a Wonderful Life, that was made back in, you know, like a classic, you know, years ago. Donnie Darko is relatively recent, 2001, I guess, right? And I'm thinking, gosh, our culture has drastically changed from the point where everyone was you know, you know, you're you're going to make a, a good, you know, a significant benefit to everyone around you. 
this happens and all of a sudden kids can literally grow up feeling like the world would be better off without them. Wow, what a, what a different cultural narrative, a meta-narrative, if you think about it. The world would be better off without me. Whoa, that's oh, drastic psychological change to do that. Um, and your, your thought reminded me of that Donnie Darko movie, you know, that evil could just, you know, since grabbed you. And there's a lot of interesting movies and, and stories about that, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Another thing I thought was kind of interesting from the trailer here, um, the bunny rabbit. So was it just him who was like destined to die or destined to just be like a bad influence on everyone? Or was it influence from whatever that rabbit was, kind of telling him, ordering his steps, and stuff like that. So like, is that evil? And that's some type of like, personified form, you know? And then contrasting that to our shooter, like was, was there a bunny rabbit in his case, or was he just destined to be evil, or do, do that, you know? Yeah. And of course, I, we don't yet have a technology, maybe we never will. We'll be able to see inside his mind and know what's going on, what had going on that led him to do that. I don't think we'll ever have the answer. I don't think so either. I think it's just part of the, if we don't know everything, you know? That's yeah, yeah. Will they have technology now where they can start seeing your dreams? Yeah, you have some kind of uh, thing where it reads your, uh, it's like a CAT scan, and it reads your, your uh, brain activity, and then based on that, it'll make images uh, based on, like, how active parts of your brain are, and they can actually get, like, actual uh, accurate images of what you were dreaming. So we might get there eventually. It'd be pretty cool to see, but definitely not probably in our lives. You know, there, there, it's kind of an interesting situation where I guess it's MRIs, functional MRIs can actually see your thoughts, so to speak, while you're making a decision. So they can set you up with, okay, do you want to click A or B? And in the MRI, they could see the mind make the decision. And then you become aware of it. Right. So it appears that what you think of as your free choice was actually made for you. And you were kind of not really making the decisions, but you're just kind of supervening on top of this decision-making process and thinking it you're the driver. I suppose it would be almost like if you were in a self-driving car, right? You're like kids, you know, we do this to kids, you know, we put them in a toy car with a steering wheel, you know, and the kids are sitting there going like this, but of course mom is the one pushing the grocery cart wherever it goes, so it's not going because the kids are turning the wheel, etc., right? You know, the same thing with, you know, toy you know, cars in like a, an amusement park where, you know, you're going like this, you know, honking the horn, you can honk the horn and stuff, but, you know, the car is on a track or something, you know, so it's not really responding to you. You know, so in a way, uh, what this new development in science seems to indicate is that you feel like you're driving the car, but you're not. You know? well, you're the car, right? You're not really driving it. Well, what if when, what if you make a conscious like life decision to change a direction? Like say, uh, you always eat fast food and then you make a conscious decision one day, okay, no, we're gonna be healthy now, right? So wouldn't that mean that you're consciously affecting your unconscious that then become conscious decisions? Because up until that point, you would have had no reason for your brain to autopilot decide that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A friend of mine used to be an alcoholic, and the doctor told him, you have to stop this, you know, or you're going to you know, kill yourself or whatever. And so from that moment on, he did. 
hasn't had a drink since. So that was, well, what the heck, he's 90 now, and that was in his 30s, so. Ooh, wow. Yeah, if you think about it, you know, that's. That's a good job. Yeah, so, you know, he's still, he, like, he's one of the members in our drinking group that meets Wednesday night, and he just has, like, a Sprite every, every time. Um, so that's kind of amazing. That's discipline right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's one of our community leaders in a lot of ways too, actually. So it's it's like it's not just that kind of personal control, self control that he had, but really had quite an impact on, on the community. Um, well, it's kind of interesting. Stephen Pinker was one of the ones that uh, Daniel Dennett talks about as one of the significant players in, uh, in his uh, 2003 video, um, and still is. I mean, Steven Pinker is a neat character. I think I have him on my list of philosophers, although I guess everybody's picked their philosopher by now uh, for their term paper, but he's pretty cool. He's also, uh, just my own interest, he's an Ashkenazi, uh, you know, so, so why are the Ashkenazis so brilliant? You know, it seems like all Ash if you're you're genetically Ashkenazi, you're what is Ashkenazi? Ashkenazi. Well, there's two uh, uh, traditional genetic lines of the Orthodox Jewish, uh, uh, and Ashkenazi is one in Sef Sephardim. Is I said did I say that right? The the southern is Sephardim. Sephard Sephardic, so Sephardic Jews and Ash Ashkenazi. Is the other, um, and by the way, his wife, Stephen Pinker's wife, is Ashkenazi also. Um, oh, I didn't want that. Huh? I'm in the wrong. Found the Russian version. I guess, ah, okay, so. That's kind of an interesting argument over why they might be so intelligent. Part of it might have been the fact that one theory is that you know, if you were Jewish uh, in the pogroms that occurred in Europe, only the really smart ones were able to escape and avoid being killed. So, so they were kind of dumber ones were weeded out, so you end up with right, smarter and smarter. Just kind of interesting. But no, I got my DNA thing back and pfft, no, no Ashkenazi for me. 1.2% Neanderthal though, remember that's kind of, so ever since I found that out I've been like defending the Neanderthal whenever I hear somebody says, why are you being so Neanderthal? Uh, hey. I happen to be proud of my Neanderthal, you know, ancestors. You know. <laughs> I don't know what they would have sounded like, actually. Hilarious verse. So, yeah, um, yeah. They're like if you look at uh, the bell curve and you look at their IQs in tests, their averages are like 100. And 10 or above, you, you know, the average is 100 for the main set of people that were, that, that's what's established IQ of 100 was. Are these people who are part of the Jewish culture too or just average citizens who happen to be Ashkenazi? I could be either. Because uh, if it's part it's of the culture, genetic, it, it's so, culture. So they, they, they tended to only marry within families, mm -hmm. very strictly, uh, um, uh, and as a result their, their genes are very kind of a tight-knit group, but they're also, their IQs test always high, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. An awful lot of scientists and mathematicians. It's an abstract kind of, if you're, you're familiar with Gardner's concept of multiple intelligences, 
I've never heard of it. Um, so I, I don't know if it's actually still in vogue or not, but. Um, So this was. Uh, um, oh, is this like where some people are like street smart? Kinesthetic. What you have intelligence and in, in like how you so like if you're a really great basketball player, almost everything you throw finds the basket. That's kind of a kinesthetic intelligence. You also have emotional intelligence and understanding how somebody feels and so on. Um, yeah, so visual, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, musical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, linguistic, logical, mathematical, etc. So, so, so if we're trying to figure out your IQ, his his argument is that there's lots of different kinds of skills, intelligence. Some people are better than others. You know, obviously. Um, I don't know how that still plays out in the, uh, the, the idea is that there's kind of a, a kind of natural fluency, uh, you know, speed of decision making and accuracy that is going to come out in virtually any of the different ways that intelligence is used so that in a sense you could take different kinds of tests and some individuals will be high in all of them so they're measuring instead of IQ what they call is G your, your, I don't know why it's called G I forget I know I used to know it but I don't remember it. but the, the the best explanation of that from like 98 was the bell curve And that was um, Murray, Hernstein. So, so if you look, so right, you know, how do you measure intelligence? Um, there's lots of different kinds of tests and so on, uh, but it seems like out of the thousands of different genetic, so, so it's not a racial thing. A lot, of, a lot of people criticize the book, still do today, criticize the book because they interpreted it as saying that certain races were more intelligent than others. Absolutely, the book denies that. So when I hear someone criticizing the book for say, saying that intelligence is racial based, I immediately form an opinion of them that's they didn't understand the book, <laughs> right? It's kind of, kind of crazy because a lot of the folks that, that feel like that is the case are, I would otherwise think of as quite intelligent, but that can be an indicator to me that, whoa, either they didn't read the book and they're just saying what they've heard other people say about it, that's probably most likely. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if they actually read the book, they interpreted it in a way that's specifically being denied by the book. What's that explain? What's that say to you, right? Um, so, uh, but but so, in the introduction, I think is where you get the best explanation of kind of the history of the IQ test. You know, so that how it was misused. An awful lot of what they described was the misuse of it, and the United States was like the place where that happened. There were authors and things that were, were basically having an influence on who was allowed into the United States, right? Immigration restrictions, you know, they only wanted Northern Europeans, Protestant Northern Europeans. You know, that, you know, so we had laws that prevented people like the Jews and uh, people from Asia and, and so on coming into the country you know, because the people that were kind of running the elite were trying to restrict it to people like them, basically, right? Wasps, right? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant, right? right? You're familiar with that, yes? 
Um, of course, you know, there were periods where different uh, immigration waves came and so on. Um, that became a eugenics thing. They actually, in our country, we, we uh, uh, actually, uh, what's it called when you, you make it impossible for a woman to have a child? There's a name for it. I can't think of it right now. Well, there's like sterilize. Of, yeah, sterilize. Yeah. Sterilize. There were so so people that were listed as like having a dumb IQ, they literally sterilized them so they couldn't have more children because well you've seen the movie Idiocracy. Right? Uh, so so the idea that, you know, stupid people have more children than smarter people. As a result, when the population keeps becoming more and more stupid, and eventually, uh, what's going to happen is you know the the whole world will be all stupid, and there won't be any smart people left. And the, right, idiocracy. Yes. I've seen it. You've seen it. All seen it. Hilarious. But kind of, you know, that doesn't really work. Because you can have smart people come out of even the craziest families, right? That happens too. Um, when you think about it, like most, I think, of the greatest composers back in the age, they were from poor, really low income families. It's not that they were stupid per se, they were uneducated and they were they were poor. So they came up everybody had the large families back then. You had seven or eight children on average, right? So Beethoven, Mozart, and that's just examples of how that's wrong. Well, that wasn't, I, I mean, there were some nobles that wrote music as kind of a hobby, but it wasn't like they were too busy being king, you know, to write much music. King Henry VIII wrote music. Richard the Lionheart wrote music. Those are examples. I don't know who else did. I, I imagine there were some, but um, so it was a lower class job, basically, to uh, like Mo the Mozart family, although the, every single kid in the Mozart family had an instrument or two or three. And they were all playing music as a whole family when Mozart was just an infant. By the time he was four, he was playing instruments too and composing. Right? When did he theoretically compose his first piece? It was like four or something, and everyone thought it was really his older sister that did it. But, you know, it made it seem more impressive if it was the four-year-old kid that did it. You know, so, and it was a show. They were they were kind of like a freak show, going around and performing music. This little four-year-old playing, you know, complex music. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, well, so if we think about um, Daniel Dennett's argument, instead of saying that that freedom somehow breaks into the chain of causality as Sartre does, and that you're condemned to be free because of your human nature, you've got this gap. So you're the one that has to make decisions. Then it accepts the idea that our brains are predetermined to make the decisions, but in a very practical sense, freedom evolves because, and, and in a very simple sense, we've got more decisions that we can make on our own than we used to. When I was picking out what clothes I wanted to put on this morning, I had so much, I, I almost was stuck well, like I, I love the the paralysis of choice, isn't it? Or the paradox of choice. Yeah, the paradox of choice. So you have so much choice. You know, you go into the store, and you know, you're just looking for something to eat, and you have so many choices. You can actually get stuck. 
not be able to choose. <laughs> There's so many choices. You know, if, what should I put on? You know, if I only had two or three shirts, oh, that would be pretty easy. But if I've got like 15, 20, 30 shirts, dang, I have no clue what I should put on, right? You'd be just stuck. That's when you, it's good that you have a wife and you say to your wife, what should I wear? <laughs> and they'll tell you, put this on. Okay. Whew. Thank goodness, I was stuck, right? <laughs> but it's also the case with cars. I mean, look at the, ch I, I mean, if you think about it as an American, you've got all these choices. As long as you have the capital that you can use to buy it, or what do you want to be, you have all these choices. People did not use to have that many choices that they could make. So what's a good quiz question? What's the hardest choice you ever made? Do you mind these questions are really quite personal? You don't have to be personal in responding to them. But what is the hardest choice you ever had to make? I should probably give my own answers to some of these too. Asking someone to marry you, joining the army, the major you pick. Whether or not you'll go to the next concert in Las Vegas. Not our choice. Any questions? Are you guys having fun? Is this a good, good set of topics? Interesting discussion today, at least. I like it. Thank you for your input, too, because I really shouldn't be the only one talking on these kind of you guys should. Professor Jarvis, shut up, sit down. We'll take it. You too. Be safe. Don't spend all that permanent fun money in one spot. Have a good one. Even though I guess that's all what they, they want you to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> you too. Yeah, I'll follow the news. I think, you know, I, I have no, I, I mean, it's just overwhelming that he had such an arsenal for so long. No one knew what he was planning. How did the hotel let him come in with all of those guns and 